This year we're looking at the book of 1 Corinthians under the title A.D., the year of the Lord. Our world is obsessed with chasing our dreams and following our ideas and feelings. But instead of being fulfilled, we're struggling and wasting our time. We need a Lord, someone we respect, who can tell us what's true and how to live. May these messages inspire you. To... Well, good morning, everybody. I hope you're taking your communion. Please do. Is there some sort of plague area in those couple of rows of the chairs there? Did I not? Oh, those are the people that are camping. Okay. You are allowed to take different chairs, all right? Like there's, you don't own that particular chair. So welcome to move around as you need to. Um, praise God. Listen, um, before we get into the message today, I am going to just update you just a little bit on what's been going on with our, our pledge uh, stuff. Every year we, um, we stop and we say that it's, it's time for us to... De- to invest our seeds that God has put into our lives so that we can increase God's kingdom. And we, all, we ask everybody in the church to participate in prayer by saying, God, what do you want me to do? And we never put any heavies on anybody, but we just try to recognize that God has provided us with more than enough, and some of that more than enough is seeds to be sown into his kingdom, which you are responsible to make your own decisions for and to invest. Our investments this year are going to be in three different areas. The Goaler Church, which we talked to them about this this morning, was that we want them to invest in their future building, which we haven't yet found, but we believe will come across. And then eventually, we have that, but no money, we can't buy it. So we wanted them to preemptively start giving towards their Goaler building. The goal for the Elizabeth Church is for us to pay off this facility. We've been in this facility now for 10 years, and I felt that it was in the Lord that it's at 10 years that we should eliminate the debt. The debt on this building is $130,000 or $128,000. So I've been talking to everybody just about that and about it, this church participating in, in eliminating that debt. The Salisbury Church um, bought a building last week, so that's pretty exciting for them. Yeah. <laughs> They, uh, they bought uh, a set of shops, just like we did, uh, bought a set of shops in Salisbury Park, and they're going to need about $200,000 to renovate it. So that's going to be their goal for this year, to provide the money that it takes to get that into its new purpose. And we're really excited about it because the, the, the building, the set of shops, is right next to Salisbury Park Primary School and a kindy over the back. And a bunch of people are already starting to dream about ways that we can work with that school community and the families that are connected with it to really benefit them and to build up their lives and bring them the gospel. So we're really looking forward to that. So please be praying about that. But um, the only reason I'm talking about this, at the end of the month, we're going to ask everybody for their intentions by giving us a pledge commitment card, and then it's completely up to you. But I just wanted to make you know what the need is, and then to trust that God's Holy Spirit will lead you. So that's the end of the heavy talk on cash, and now I'm going to leave it up for the Holy Spirit to put on the real heavies. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you provide more than enough for every single one of us. Uh, but you also provide us with wisdom on how to steward what you've entrusted to us. And so we're asking for that today and praying, Holy Spirit, that you would guide every man and woman in this room to make a decision about how you want them to participate in the needs that Hope Central has financially. And Lord, I pray that no person would feel at all manipulated, nor would they feel like this is a constant drive for money. But Lord, that you would, by your grace, Make us able to see the vision and participate it in the power and the strength that you have for us, Lord. So Holy Spirit, tell every person, and I pray that you would give them faith and obedience to respond in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're continuing on in our series uh, for today on, uh, I'm starting a new series called Morality, all right? Um, So let's, let's just kind of talk about the why first. We've been talking about how this year is the year of the Lord. And we're just sort of this sort of a faith imagination that pretend that the Christian church actually obeyed Jesus. What? No, that wouldn't happen, would it? Um, and of course, yeah, just because he's got the title of Lord doesn't mean that people listen to him. But that was probably the intention. Um, and as we look in the book of First uh, Corinthians, which we've chosen to follow through this year, the First Corinthian church is the church that gets to hear the word Lord more than anyone else because they are so off track that they're feeling the... T- you know when you got like a horse and you're trying to steer it down the road, you pull on the reins, and the reins uh, attach to a bit in the horse's mouth, and that, that bit causes it discomfort in its mouth when the, ho- when the person riding the horse needs to steer it. 
pulls hard on the reins. Sometimes you don't even feel the, 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 the bit, you don't feel the irritation of it because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. And every now and then, though, if the rider is Jesus, he should be pulling on your mouth a little bit, going, this way, this is the way, go this way. And by the way, I've got the reins. Now, he's not cruel, he's not trying to destroy us, he's trying to keep us on the path. If he doesn't steer us, we're going to go off the cliff and down. So he wants us to stay on the path. Now, the reason that we're talking about morality is because the Corinthian church is known for immorality. So now you're thinking, what a funny guy that Pastor Joe is. He's just like one snappy comment after another. So <laughs> let's just talk about these, these Corinthian church. The Corinthian church is the kind of the church that's, you know, it's like the, the strange, weird uncle of the church uh, letters, right? It's the weird guy that you don't want to talk about because he's just blown and he's not getting it right. But God in his faithfulness continues to not only invest by writing to that church, but he also invests by making the apostle Paul capable of guiding them out of the dirt and into the good, right? Getting us back on the path. But let me just read to you a passage that is in 1 Corinthians. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It starts in verse 9. This is how he's talking to these Christian people. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world, the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed, is an, or is an adulterer, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is, not, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Isn't that a fun verse? Everybody just looking forward to hearing Pastor Joe come down harsh on immorality today. You feeling good about that? Isn't that going to be exciting and fun? Amen. Yes and amen. Hallelujah. Squirming your seats. It's going to be such a great time as we talk about it. Hopefully from such a pleasant angle that you'll be just so grateful by the end. One of the verses that's in the book of, of Corinthians, in the middle of this passage on immorality, and immorality is not just sexual, but it's in any area of life where we are casting aside the guiding wisdom of God and his commands to follow our own path, and those things are not to be happening in the Christian church. How could those led by the Holy Spirit do things that God condemns? We've got to find that, that right path and stick to it. So right in the middle of that passage and discussion, he, he quotes them back to themselves. So Paul is not just writing to them. He is responding to their letters. And in their conversation, they make a statement to him that Paul uses to help understand what the problem is. This is what they say. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food. And Paul's answer is, and God will destroy both one and the other. So I just want, well, let's talk about it from this way of talking about it like hunger. All of that sinfulness that we call immorality comes from a misunderstanding of hunger. So Ecclesiastes has got this great statement, and I think it's probably the best way to summarize the way that people behave when they have a sense of hunger in their life. If you've got desire, what do you do to fill the desire? And so he writes this, he says, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward in all my toil. So I love this picture about how he's got this, he's got this hole in his heart and this stream of things that are flowing through it with the expectation that one of them or some of them or all of them are going to be able to fill him up and make him feel content. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of life, isn't it? Where we kind of go from one, oh, you know, like when you were little, you're like, oh, I can't wait to ride a bike. And you say, my life will be so full when I ride a bike. And then you ride that bike and you're like, I can't wait till I drive a car. Then I'll be happy. And then it's not that piece of junk car that you just couldn't wait to have. And then it's like this better car and better car. And we keep filling our, you know, one car goes in and, and it goes out. And we're just hoping that next one will make us feel good. Or maybe for you it was TVs. 
You know, like you had like a tiny TV that barely functioned and just got to get bigger and bigger. And you're like, wow, I'm going to build my room out of TVs, like giant screens that fill the whole, and then I'll be happy and filled with radiation. And I'll finally, but it's, it doesn't work. Or maybe for you, it's like relationships. You're like, that person doesn't satisfy me. That's not enough. I'm going to get, get rid of that person and get on this person and that person. And then they don't satisfy you. So you're going to get better, upgrade, get better. Maybe it's experiences. Like I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. Have a holiday. Have try this a little bit, or maybe for you, it's all messed up in sexual experiences where that didn't satisfy, so we'll go for that and over that and go for that. But nothing does, like in this constant cycle. But the weird thing is Solomon says, it's kind of entertaining. I was satisfied in my toil. The weird thing is, we line up these, oh, if I have this, I'll be fulfilled. We chase that for five years, and we kind of enjoy the fun. Oh, wasn't that a challenge exciting? Wasn't that a really good time? You know, like, the, there, you know, like this year, there was like a massive traffic jam up at uh, Everest. You know why? One of the major components of that are CEOs. CEOs of businesses. They're like, we conquered everything. We're super wealthy. It doesn't even matter what the paycheck is anymore because we've got more money than we can spend. What do we need now? I need another challenge. So let's climb Mount Everest. So they got like the super oxygen pack. They could probably fly a plane to the top and land, but no, the challenge. So you got all of these white collar workers up there that have, you know, been to the gym for the last six months so they can climb this mountain because if I only do that, then I'll feel satisfied. But weirdly, chasing the goal feels like a kind of satisfaction. So is it true? Or is it more like we're in a hunger game? that we're constantly craving for more, and the competition ends up killing all the other children. Do you ever watch The Hunger Games? That is like the worst movie. I, like if you, I can't get past the part where all the kids compete and have to kill one another. So there's only one winner. I don't know. This sounds like they're starting big business. So here's the way the advertising works on you. This is the ADA model for advertising. If good advertising creates attention, uh, gets interest, uh, spurs desire and then causes action. And so this is a world in which we live all the time. And you know what this relies on? It relies on the fact that we're hungry. We want something. But maybe we don't know we're hungry. So what we have to do is get our attention. They have advertising sounds, all of this kind of stuff. What about the interest? Do you want this product? Why wouldn't you want this product? This product is the product you really want products. And then the desire. Wow, that product will make me so happy. I can't wait to get it. And then action. I gotta go and buy this or nag my dad until I get it. Right? Whatever the action point is. Now, it's successful because we want. And it's not even just like the West. Here's a great Soviet um, advertising for a fantastic pair of shoes that are going to satisfy every good Soviet woman. <laughs> but it gets the attention. It's got the appropriate McDonald's colors. It's got a fantastic... She's so excited about those shoes, she's not even wearing them. She just looks at them. And every other good Soviet woman also wants to get a pair of these shoes too because then they'll be happy like she is. Now, of course, it's not just them. It's every culture in the world. I was really surprised when I was in the Philippines. I'm going, we were walking down this road and like to get into this little like fake shop, there was a guy rolling a, a hand cart stacked with about five stacks of Mountain Dew cases. And I'm thinking, you people can't afford shoes and you're buying Mountain Dew? And Mountain Dew is like, I don't know if you know this, it's like the most sugary drink ever in the whole world. They actually have a condition called Mountain Dew Mouth, where like communities have children with rotted out teeth from drinking Mountain Dew from the bottle. And, and these people are selling it like it's not just a drink, it's an adventure. This is a fulfilling drink, not like those other drinks that just have water. But notice, they're Indian people, excited and good looking. Of course, we all know the McDonald's advertising. You so want this. Now, put up your hand if you so want McDonald's. Just the one. That's honesty. That's fine. Now you really want it. But there's not many people that get like, wow, squishy food, easy to digest. Like, is that what the cell is on that? Or maybe it's, you know, luxury cars. But it's not just the car, because let's all, let's all be honest. A Kia is not a satisfying car, all right? That's the car you need, right? That's the car you're getting to, to whatever, school with, whatever. It's, it's economical and affordable. That's what it is. 
But the guy in the basketball, he gets, he's famous and he's awesome and he's cool. So you want to be cool like him. So you buy that car. You want that car. There's one of my favorite ads that I, I was found when I was looking. It said, love this statement. Freedom is discovering there is life after the minivan. You got this lovely couple enjoying life, cruising off. Do you know that that is not an ad for MGs? It's a car. It's an ad for chewing gum. What? <laughs> like, I just want to be free like those people who don't have minivans anymore. And my life will be so good. I'll be th- I'm going to feel so free. I'm going to choose my own gum. <laughs> like, what? How is that making you more fulfilled? It works like this. Thing you, this. you need this thing. Everyone else has one. It'll change your life. And then you go out and buy it. Desire and hunger at work. I don't know if you're a fan of uh, economics. Anyone? Hands? Economic fans? Okay, a couple of economic fans. There was economic theory that changed when industrialization came into the world. There was a lot of questions about, about this idea. If, if machines, factories, can produce products so cheap that anyone can buy them, won't that kind of put everyone out of business? Because... If you, you've lived your entire life with two sets of clothes because they're so expensive to buy, and now we can make you a set of clothes that is a fraction of the cost, you're going to buy your two sets and never buy another set. And then all of that hard work that used to happen to get the economy working is not going to happen, and we'll all just kind of suffer behind, so we need to stay away from these machines. That was the thought. Until Adam Smith came up with a really good idea. Well, it's not his idea. It's something he noticed. He called it the invisible hand. He says, economics economics works because the forces of market competition act like an invisible hand so that self-interest behavior can work to the benefit of all society. Isn't that great to know? Listen, the fact that you're greedy is providing jobs for people. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, The forces of individual self-interest and competition ensure that resources are used in ways to promote economic growth and national prosperity, which basically means like this. Damien's got desires. Man, has he got a lot of desires. And that is good for everybody. Because when Damien wants stuff, then he's willing to buy stuff. So his great desires are putting car manufacturers to work, a clothing manufacturer, building hardware. Bunnings is benefiting from his desire for better tiling. Like, he is putting people to work. Now, isn't his fantastic self-interest doing great? And then those guys got money. And then with their money, they also have desires. They want special customized pets. They want to have holiday experiences. They want to buy new minivans. And then they get chewing gum. They want all this stuff. So his self-interest and their self-interest works together so that we're all constantly greedy for more. Yay. And he calls it the invisible hand. It's not invisible. It's us. It's us and the devil and the whole world system. It's how we, it's why there's always a market for a bigger television. Because the fact that we can get one makes us want the next, and then because there is more, and then, have you ever gone to like a, like a electronics shop these days? And you're trying to weave your way through the giant TVs? Like, there's the size of sailboats. Some are even curved like sails. It's huge. You can feel like a radiation coming off all of these things. People will always want more. That's why we should always produce more, they say. Now, but does it really work? Well, so- uh, Solomon says, and I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I'd expended in doing it. And behold, it was all a vanity and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. You know, this is, I don't know if you've ever felt this, but when the new car smell wears off and you're just kind of like, I'm just in another car that I didn't really need. And you go, what is the point? The disillusionment from the idea that the dream fulfilled would leave me fulfilled. And then when it doesn't happen, how often do you do that before you eventually go, this is such a waste of time. What are we really working for? If you're young, let me tell you, all of those people who are older and, and have more money than you and they're buying all that stuff, they are as less satisfied than you are now. It doesn't get better. Solomon was old and he said, it doesn't work and it hasn't worked. And if you're saying, well, if I had more money, he had all the money and it didn't work. So, Corinthians, logic. 
They say, all things are lawful for me. But Paul says, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I won't be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and stomach for the food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual, sexual, sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So I just got to put a little bit of comedy in there. It's a little slip of the tongue. This, this is them, their ideas about the way that things are and why they're okay. And they have kind of two different things. In the context of this passage, there is a discussion about sex and money. In the first eight verses, it's all about how the desire for money and the frustration when I can't get what I deserve is at work. They begin to fight with each other. And he's saying money is causing a problem in the church. You should be better at making those decisions. And then he talks, starts talking about the desire or the striving for sexual fulfillment and talking about how the way they're going about satisfying that is leaving them worse off because they're breaking rules that they don't even know exist. So they had two sayings. The reasons they felt permission for this is because they said, well, all things are lawful for me. Now let's just ask ourselves the question. People today would not say, all things are lawful for me. They would say something more like, limiting the self is wrong. If I want something, if I have a goal or a dream, that I ought to be able to pursue that because that's what individual freedom means. Being able to get what you want. Live like you want, think like you want, have what you want. Freedom should never be limited. And why would God limit, it, limit freedom? What is he, like a freedom hater? And they also thought food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food. So they thought, the reason that we have these desires, they're there for a reason. If I want these things, then surely it's right, because why would I have these desires if it wasn't right? Like when, I was, uh, when I was in Bible college for the summertime one year, I went and worked in the mine that my dad worked in. So I'm just like a 19-year-old kid, and I go to work in a remote place with 400 other men. I just want you to make a guess at what the lunchroom looked like. If you're thinking pornography, you're thinking too small. It was wallpapered in pornography. It was, there was two women that worked on the church, on the church. <laughs> Sorry, that was a different story. It was, there was, there was only two women that worked in the mine site, and both of them had worse mouths than the men. Uh, and so I'm sitting in, you sit in the lunchroom, I kind of walk in and my, you know, I mean, I'm not totally dumb, but I'm walking into a situation, I'm like, I'm not, didn't think it was going to be like this. <laughs> sit there, it's wallpaper to pornography, I'm like, oh, hello. Hard to eat with your hands up here. But it's even harder because the guy sitting across from me is reading his lunchtime pornography magazine. And because they knew that I was my dad's son, because that was well known, and they called my dad the reverend. The reason that they called him the reverend is that for a very long time, he would talk to people about what they were doing as being wrong. And he's kind of the guy that you, doesn't really care what you think. And he would go around the mine site and tear the pornography off the wall. And then they got wise to him, because this is a mine site. There is plenty of ways to stick stuff to other stuff. Industrial adhesive, aplenty. So they would almost laminate with super kind of adhesives stuff. So dad would try to pull it up. He couldn't pull it off the wall without like ripping the metal off the wall, right? <laughs> Can't do it. So he went, ah, you're super smart and wasted a lot of time. So he'd carry around a can of spray paint. <laughs> and he would just sort of G-rate them, you know, just give them a bikini. <laughs> You know, something like that. Maybe a burka. I don't know. <laughs> and they would get super irritated about it. So I was kind of famous. I was famous in this context for being anti-pornography without saying a word. Hello. And the arguments I had with the guys, arguments, comments made in high tone voices. We, we talked a lot about, they said, if I enjoy this, why is it wrong? If the person who's in this magazine got paid to be there and they look like they're happy, this is just people, both people getting what they want. They want money, I want to see them in the nude, and so this is all mutually beneficial. And if I have all these desires and God made them so beautiful, what's wrong about any of this? They couldn't see it through the idea. All things are lawful for me, and if the stomach is made for food, isn't it? If I got desire, it's meant to be 
craving should be fulfilled. So Paul has, or the Holy Spirit has two answers. All things are lawful for me. Answer one, not all things are helpful. <laughs> I know you think you can do anything, but not everything you think you can do is going to help you. He says, not, I will not be dominated by anything. Like, I, I understand this. As a Canadian person, when you drive through the Rocky Mountains, the reason that there are barriers on the side of the road is because beyond the barrier is death. And if you're like, well, I will, all things are lawful for me, and if I want to drive off the sheer cliff and down to the ravine below that and blow up, well, that is my choice. Paul's saying, yeah, all things are lawful, but isn't it, it, there is stupid and then there's stupid, right? Like this, it is not good. The reason that God gives boundaries to life is so that our lives work, not so they break. So, the second one, food is meant for the stomach, and stomach for the food, Paul says, or the Holy Spirit says, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Like he's saying, I know you think that your physical body is all about your pleasure seeking, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because the most pleasurable thing for your body is the Lord. If you spend what is your physical life chasing after a pleasure that is not God, then you have wasted your physical life. There's nothing better than the Lord. And I love that about Paul. He points us up. He doesn't point us down. So what do we do with desires? If food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food. Well, remember this. Christians are spirit-led beings. Christians are to be led by the Holy Spirit. We have, through this mystical union, when we become children of God, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So my spirit comes alive when I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and I am after that a spirit-led person. That means that my mind, will, and emotions, my point of view, and my desires become subject to the spirit. And my physical world, the senses, walks in obedience to those desires. Now, what that means is the spirit is meant to control the soul and the soul is meant to control the body. And God has better plans for us than us simply responding to the next desire. The Holy Spirit has something better for us. Okay, well, the question is, is the quest for more okay? The fulfillment of physical desires and the acquisition of possessions. Because I know what you're thinking. You know, here he is, Pastor Joe. He's going to tell us to invest in Hesham because we're just going to make underwear out of Hesham and clothes out of Hesham. And we're going to give all of our stuff away. That's why he's shaking us down. He wants the cash. And what he's going to tell us is just give away everything we own and never have everything fun in our lives and eat bland food with, like, you know, plastic forks that you don't throw away but you wash. <laughs> and plastic and just like sell our houses and buy hovels and like look like we're hobbits and just live with nothing because all desire is bad. That's what you're expecting. I know where you're going. You're like, you bossy pastor. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. And that's not what God is talking about because if you read the Bible at all, you'll find that every single person that connects their life with God ends up with a lot of blessings in their physical world. Absolutely every story is about God going, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. He gives us stuff. But if he gives us stuff, it's good for us. When we crave stuff, it's bad for us. So we're not saying it's bad, but it is bad if it's not within the kingdom rules. If you are seeking for something that's beyond the boundary, that's over the fence, that's stopping you from the ditch, and you go beyond that boundary, it's bad. Every time it's bad. You can't reason with it. It's bad. And also, we need to ask the question, what exactly is driving that need anyway? So, in Genesis chapter 3, verses, chapter 3, verse 3 to 5, Adam and Eve confront the great tempter, who is Satan. And Satan is going to misrepresent a couple of things. He's going to misrepresent God. He's going to misrepresent what is on offer. He's going to misrepresent the people. He's a chronic liar. And he cast a picture about something that he twists a good thing and makes it turn out bad. 
And so he says this, God knows, he's trying to get her to eat the forbidden fruit. God knows that when you eat, uh, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, can I ask you this question? Is there anything wrong with being like God? Is God beautiful? Yeah. Is he lovely? Is he wise? Is he good? Is he holy? Is he righteous? Is he fulfilled? Is there anything wrong with being like God? No, there's nothing wrong with being like God. In fact, the whole purpose of the gospel is to shape us into the image of Christ so we can become like him. But how we become like him is very, very different. He turns her desire for God because she loves him. She, he turns her desire into something that she's going to fulfill in her own way to fulfill a deeper need. It says... So when the woman saw that the tree was good, so the advertising was working, it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desired to make one wise. She sees the, all of the benefits of it and thinks, interprets those things as something that will be fulfilling to her. Well, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and he ate. So if you don't know the outcome of the story, that's the story of the fall of humanity, that when desire is corrupted... It will lead us in a bad way every single time. But the weird thing is, Adam and Eve were already fulfilled. They, they walked with God every single day. Were they hungry? Were they thirsty? Did they need to know everything? If God is standing next to them explaining everything, were they not in a perfect Eden? And yet still this desire was created that if you have, if you have, if you have, well, when desire goes wrong, it destroys and this is the message that I think 1 Corinthians teaches us. I know that there's some people who think that the book of 1 Corinthians is a massive slap to the, anybody who's doing things wrong. In 1 Corinthians, you find the references like, you know, those who are adulterers, adulterers, those who are homosexual offenders, those who are uh, greedy, those who are uh, swindlers. Those who, and, and it is true that wrong is always wrong, and Paul completely lays it out there saying, that is never God's plan. But how he gets us onto the plan is not by making us focus on not being bad. He focuses on God who is with us. And that is the promise of the Holy Spirit. You see, the reason we can live moral lives is because God gives his Holy Spirit to us. It's not because we are capable of good it's because God is capable of good in us. So if you're feeling like, but I'm trapped, I'm, these desires, they hold me, or this sexual temptation has got me, or, or I, I constantly go in this pattern of doing this, making the mistake, and falling in the same hole every time, and I can't seem to get, there's no condemnation here. There's just honesty. You can't do it. We can't do it. But the Holy Spirit can do it. And so he has to write to us and remind us, some, such were some of you, bad people list above. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And there's so many fides in there. They just, I feel like an African-American preacher. Yo, he said, you are washed, you are justified, you are justified. <laughs> These things have to be read correctly in their context. Like he's saying, you, you forgot, like if the reason that you're living in the not good is because you've forgotten that the Holy Spirit has done work in you and is capable of more. If you're thinking that if you keep chasing these desires that they're going to satisfy you, you are wrong, 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 wrong. But the Holy Spirit has better for you and the ability to make it do, make do, it, do it right. Make do right. Okay. We're also... Empty, not, we're not empty, we're full. 1 Corinthians 6, 14 says, And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. He constantly focuses back to the work of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit, let's ask, can I just do a pop quest here? Right, okay, see if you can get this one. Did Jesus die? Was he totally dead? Yes, yes. he had no life in his physical body. Is that what we're talking about? Right, okay. How did he get alive again? God raised him from the dead. So, question. Can 
Good answer, Michael. Doesn't matter what Catherine says. <laughs> Can God give real life to dead people? Yes, but is that where your focus is? Are you looking for God to give you life or are you looking for you to give you life? See, he's constantly pulling us back saying, remember this, God gives life. If you're feeling like your life is not complete, get something from God, not the world. If you're feeling like you need more, get some more God. Don't get more stuff from here. If you feel like my life is empty, why fulfill yourself with more trinkets that don't satisfy? When God's got everything on display, God can give life to dead people. And wherever your life is dead, God can work. Now, Paul writes the Philippians something like this. Not that I'm speaking of being in need. He's talking about how they were generous with him, and he's thanking them for giving money. He says, because I learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Now, here, here's, this is very interesting. This is very first century and 21st century. He says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret. Now, here, he's going to talk about the worst of trials, right? I have learned the secret of facing plenty. What? <laughs> yeah, look, isn't it like the worst time for you when you're struggling and you have nothing? And you're like, oh, God, where are you? And you're tempted to steal? Isn't that like the worst time? No. There is this horrible thing in our world. It's called plenty. And here for us in the 21st century, it's not the poverty that's driving us crazy. It's the plenty that's driving us crazy. And Paul said, I got, I got a secret that you can totally, you can build up the rewards and the good things in my life and not one of them will distract me. All right. Get that alarm there. Thanks, Angelo. He says, I know the secret of, of, of facing plenty and hunger, facing abundance and need. How? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Paul said, I, I already know this. Whether I've got little, I can, God's with me. What do I need? God's with me. And when I got tons, it's not at all distracting because I got something better than this stuff. So it's not, I'm not led by the desire in my life anymore. Why? Because I am content. Does anybody here want to be content? Just to have that sense of, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that we all need an infilling of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We need to get some of His satisfaction in us, some of His pleasure, some of His, ah, this is good. God is good. And we need to have that sense and that knowledge in us that we can't chase it in the stuff. We've got to get it from Him. And He is happy to fulfill our every and our deepest needs. I am, I've, what I'm going to do is, I just want to give a couple of words that I want people to respond to in prayer, and then we're just going to close with, with the song of worship. Can I get the worship team to come up? There, there's a couple of things I just felt that, you got, you got a minute? Not too late, I'm here. <laughs> if we didn't have all that time wasting with the alarm and such, we would have been well advanced too. <laughs> um... Somebody here, I, I felt, I was praying to the Lord, what, what healing is happening this morning? And he said, cancerous growth. Somebody here has a cancerous, cancerous growth. God wants to heal that. Also, an ear infection or some kind of ringing in the ear that's been constant for a while. Oh, is it my, my, yeah. Could be you, could be me. Also, Somebody has a deep sadness, like a lingering despair that just won't lift. And God wants to heal that. Um, and then somebody else is like, and Ash's word was about this too. That somebody else, somebody's dealing with a deep fear that's really restricting their choices and, and keeping them from obeying God. 
And, and there's somebody else here, too, that you've been fighting with your spouse a lot. And I just really feel, I don't know if it's wife with, if it's the wife who's fighting or the husband who's fighting, but there's conflict somehow in that relationship. And God just wants to speak a word of peace to your house so that you can be at rest. And then I just feel like there's people that need, if you're feeling literally dissatisfied and you're feeling hungry, then why don't you come and let us pray that you'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the power and the presence of God. That will put a smile on your face like nothing else. Will. So why don't you stand with me? Let me pray and then let's worship. Father, we thank you that you love us and you do, that you are the one who satisfies the desires of our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you are a blessing to us in every way and you've entrusted so much to us, Lord. But we pray that today you would set us free from our obsession with this idea that anything in this world could satisfy us. And Lord, that you would fix our faith on you. Lord, we pray that you would bring liberty and freedom to those who are enslaved, those who have been trapped by their desires. Lord, that you deliver them out of those things and bring them into real, fulfilling life that you plan for them. Lord, as we worship, Lord, I pray that you would draw all of those that need this touch, that need these miracles in their bodies, or they need the infilling of your Holy Spirit. I pray that you draw them now, Lord, so that we can minister your grace and the power of your Holy Spirit to every need. Lord, we love you today and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.